And Harry Wilson is joining me in the studio tonight. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me, Liz. So I want to start by playing a little bit of a soundbite from the debate because it's pretty mm -hmm. pertinent to what is happening today. So mm -hmm. let's take a look at that. Sure. So he's not the governor, he's the attorney general. He's investigating you personally. Uh, is that not correct? The office has been under investigation since before I got there. Read the papers. You've seen it. Everybody knows that. I just, you, I just want to clarify, if I'm wrong uh, about this, please well, tell I, the people. The Attorney General is investigating There's an personally. investigation going on, isn't there? We all know that. It's, it's, to the, that? It's, to, it's, it's an investigation into the office. If you want to ask questions about the investigation, I'm not the one to ask. You need to ask those who are doing the investigation. All right, Mr. Okay, so those who were doing the investigation weighed in today, that's the Attorney General, and a statement from his office says, the office has concluded our review of that investment, uh, of that investment, this one that was in question that you were speaking of there, and determined that no action is warranted. Mr. DiNapoli is not involved in any investigation or matter in this office. So that seems to close the case there. Do you believe that that is it, free and clear? Well, I think on that specific question that I was asking Mr. DiNapoli that he refused to answer about whether he was under investigation, I think it does answer that question, which is, I think is a, is a good and healthy thing. There's still a number of other open questions that we've been asking for months. For example, Mr. DiNapoli has refused to release his calendar for the 26 months between the time he became controller and the time he banned placement agents, which was the core of the pay-to-play problem. And we've been asking that for, for months, and he's refused to comply. But if the AG says that there's nothing wrong there, then what do you need to see his calendar for? Well, because I think there, you know, there's a question of what the voters have in mind and the ethical cloud hanging right over the office versus the AG standard, which I, presumably is one about criminal, criminal conduct. And so all questions around the appearance of impropriety. But the, you know, for us, really, the core question comes really into the question of what's in the best interest of the state, given the fiscal crisis we're in. And we've really been talking primarily, although this issue is certainly something that we've talked about, but the issue we've primarily focused on is really who is best positioned to be the state's top fiscal watchdog, given the crisis that we're in. You know, during that same debate, there was a pretty clear narrative, and that was, which do voters hate more, Albany or Wall Street? And it's, it's quite clear. You say Tom DiNapoli is an Albany insider, and he says you're a Wall Street insider, and you're out of step with middle class values. And now I know, I obviously was there, and, and our viewers saw it too, you said, well, I'm from Johnstown originally, and, and, and I know from middle class. But what, how do you pivot away from that, and away from Wall Street is bad, and therefore I caused the, melt the meltdown, the financial meltdown? <laughs> sure, well, I think even Tom DiNapoli doesn't believe that I personally caused the financial meltdown, even though he tried to say that for uh, the entire well, entire you of the played debate. A role in it. I don't know that he <laughs> says that you're uniquely responsible for it. <laughs> it's really seemed like that, but I think the uh, you know really his his approach and my approach are very different. His entire attack on me is predicated on, on, on Wall Street experience, which I would argue actually is a huge positive for experience in, in the controller's office. Uh, and that's been the soul and substance of his entire approach to me. In my case, I've really kind of focused on a few things. One is his problems as, and his history of 200 plus tax increases in his 20 years in the assembly, his lack of leadership and a fiscal problems as controller. Um, but that's just part of it. What I've focused primarily on is, not, is contrasting his record with my record of coming in as a reformer a person with experience fixing broken companies, and a person who understands uh, all the aspects of the state, ranging from growing up in upstate New York and the values that that provided my family uh, and myself, uh, to the successful career I had in business, to what I think I could bring to the controller's office. But the tax issue, I mean, okay, he has not denied, in fact, that he mm -hmm. didn't, did vote yes on raising taxes, that he has not said that he regretted it either, but yes. what does that have to do with being controller of the state of New York? The controller audits, mm -hmm. and the controller manages the pension fund, and doesn't even actually make personal decisions about investment investments necessarily, but manages a team of people who do. Well, no, actually, he, I mean, he does have full ultimate accountability on investment decisions. That's the, the nature of the sole trustee. Well, he, right, but yes, he's fully responsible, but he doesn't show up at work every day and, like, go down the stock picks and make decisions no, about sure, that. No, sure, but he makes recommend, the recommendations made by the staff that he has ultimate decision-making authority over. Right. But I think on the, on the tax question, the reason it's, it's relevant, I think it comes to the core question of who's going to be the best watchdog for taxpayers. If, if that's the role of the controller, which is the way, the way I see it, is, is it going to be someone who believes that our current tax regime is appropriate? Who created this tax regime through his votes and and you know hundreds of votes to, to that effect, or is it someone who believes it's totally inappropriate and would work to reduce spending and reduce taxes? Now the role of the controller with the audit power is really attack that culture of spending and identify areas of, of waste. Now Mr. Napoli supported all those areas of waste and, and because he supported all those budgets for all those years. Okay, but he has said, well, what he voted yes on was spending for education, mm -hmm. spending for hospitals, spending for arts programs, whatever it was that he was voting for, sure. and that he stands by those votes because then he was subsequently reelected. So you, to turn that on around, you know what those votes were for, you know mm -hmm. what those budgets were. Would you have voted no on every single one of those times that he voted yes? 
Uh, every single one of those times we'd have to see, but certainly yeah, the, vast, the sum total of where the budget is in our state, I absolutely think we spend too much money and tax our, uh, the people of New York far too much. And, and that's, that's, that's the legacy of those choices. You know, he'll turn around and say, as you said, well, I voted for the, these following programs. The question is, what is the best use of taxpayer resources? Of course it's great to say we voted for health care and for schools and for kids. Those are all great things. But the question is, how do we best utilize taxpayer resources to provide quality service at an affordable cost? And a pro you know, really applying a cost-benefit approach to the use of government resources. And I think the fundamental distinction and philosophy between Mr. Napoli and myself is he believes that government should take more from people and spend it on those priorities. And I believe the government should take as little as possible from people while still fulfilling the core priorities of government. Okay, but again, you're not running for governor or you're not even running for legislature. Mm -hmm. You're running for an office that has more to do with investment and audit than it has yes. to do with making policy so, so let's regarding... Talk about, let's talk about the audit power. You know, for example, Mr. Napoli hasn't effectively gone after state spending. He's really spent most of his time going after local governments and audits. I believe that someone who is really, who believe that this uh, level of spending in our state is excessive would focus on the biggest problem, which is state spending and, and the tax burden associated with that. So I would go through program by program, top to bottom, line by line, the entire state budget, just like I used to do in corporate restructurings, and identify programs that are either not working very effectively, uh, poor allocation of resources, duplicative in many cases, uh, and identify those opportunities and recommend cost cuts to the governor and the legislature and work with them Which on Which they do not have to take your recommendations as we've seen, right? right? It's a bully pulpit, but you can't make them, you can lead the horse to water, but you cannot make that horse drink. Yeah, right? that is true, but I'll give you a couple a couple reasons why I think uh, what, I, the, what I can do with the role is different from what Mr. Napoli has done. First of all, I think I've got a lot more credibility on on, on turnarounds and, and fixing broken organizations. My leadership in the role of General Motors it's the largest turnaround in American history, and I think that skill set is exactly what we need for New York. Um, but the second piece of it is um, when people look at the size of our crisis, we look over the next four years, we can either do what we've done the last two years, which is pretend to make cost cuts, but actually increase taxes and borrow, or actually try to rein in the size of government and reduce costs so we can have a more affordable state. I believe that the governor, whoever it is next year, will have to deal with that. Um, because that's the only way to not become a failed one-term governor. And I think we'll have enough reformers elected in the legislature this fall, particularly in the Senate, that'll be able to work with them to really kind of incorporate those uh, recommendations into the budget. Okay, so since you bring up the governor, you, you do have a, a ticket of people. Mm -hmm. You have not endorsed Carl Valdino. You have not endorsed Dan Donovan. You've been pressed on this time and time again, and I'm just going to press you on it one more time if you would indulge me. Sorry. <laughs> um, Carl Valdino, I mean, why not say I will or will not support him? Because isn't, I know what your answer is. I'm not endorsing any anyone because I'm an independent guy and I might have the possibility, I, I will have as controller, the power to audit governor agencies under the governor and so I don't want to. Got it. But um, isn't that kind of a dodge? No, I don't think so. And I'd say the, I noticed, by the way, when you said, uh, you want to ask the question, you said one more time instead of one last time. So <laughs> I'll, I'll try to I may yet clarify. again, Harry. You just have no idea. You never know. So, uh, but I, I think, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about this. And if you notice, throughout the entire campaign, I never endorsed anybody. And I've been saying since the very beginning that I want to remain independent. And we've wrestled with what's the best way to remain independent um, and fulfill the responsibilities of the office. And we came to the conclusion, frankly, no one really even focused on my endorsement because I don't think anybody really cares <laughs> what, what my opinion is in the governor's race except the media. So I'm happy to answer the questions. But ultimately what it comes down to is I couldn't find a way to get involved in endorsements and, and not compromise the independence of the office. And that to me is the most important piece of the, okay. of, of the job. I would, I would agree with you that since people, not everyone knows who you are perhaps and you're running for an office and you're focused on who you are and trying to get people to know that, mm -hmm. that perhaps they don't care who you're going to vote for for governor. However, this is a person who has said some really controversial things. He called Shelley Silver, the assembly speaker, mm -hmm. a criminal. He has, um, you know, called the governor of New York, the current governor, a drug addict. I mean, can you at least say, I do not support those kinds of statements? Well, you know, I'm not going to get a, a kind of a blanket denunciation of everything that the gentleman's ever said. I mean, certainly some things I disagree with, and I, I wouldn't have um, made the, refer the comments of the speaker that he made. Uh, I do think there are massive problems in the legislature that the speaker and other members of the legislature should be held accountable for. But I, you know, I, there's no evidence that that rises to the level of criminality. Um, so that that's you know kind of one piece of it. But you know, of course, Carl Paladino is much broader than a handful of controversial comments. And his general message is about cutting spending and cutting taxes, which I think is a message the state desperately needs. 
Uh, and so um, that's kind of my general view, but to the extent I end up getting into any of the specifics, one, it detracts from the message I'm trying to give, which is the state's in a massive fiscal crisis, and I think I've got a skill set to help fix it. Uh, and two, it gets me into the position where it starts to question, uh, compromise my independence, which I think is a bad thing for the voters of the state. You are starting to and increasingly focus on this contrast, right, between mm -hmm. yourself versus Tom DiNapoli. Are you going to not, given what we saw today with the investigation, are you no longer going to make that a campaign issue? Well, we still have, you know, like we said at the beginning of this interview, the we have the transparency right. questions and the questions of what he did, when, and who he met with, and all those questions that we've been asking for months. We actually kept that um, just uh, kind of relatively quiet. We had issued a series of full requests, waiting for the data, thinking that he would comply. He said it was too um, broad. He was sitting here with me on the show, and he said he thought that the, it was an impossible uh, request to fill. Well, last I checked, uh, and all you have to do to print your calendar is press print and Outlook. And I assume that the, the gentleman who manages 2,600 people and consumes $380 million of taxpayer resources in the controller's office every year has the ability to do that. Well, you, speaking of this contrast that you're trying to make, mm -hmm. you have this new ad I want to take a look at. Sure. It's just out right today. The Albany insiders handpicked Tom DiNapoli for controller, another career politician who's taxed and spent our state into crisis. I'm Harry Wilson, and fortunately, I'm not a politician. I'm a fiscal expert. I fix broken companies and I can help fix New York. I'll shine a spotlight on state government, top to bottom, line by line. A forensic audit of every dollar we spent. Albany insiders have had their turn. Now it's our turn. Okay, so that's pretty clear. You're just mm -hmm. laying out exactly what we've been discussing here, but yeah. the, the real issue is that you've got to get your name recognition up, and this is probably the best way to do it. Sure. So we've also had this conversation before. I'm going to ask you anyway. Are mm -hmm. you going to stay on the air between now and uh, Election Day? Are you going to blanket the airwaves, and how much money are you going to spend? <laughs> so, I love um, this question. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, the, first of all, that ad is entirely consistent with the message we've been delivering all through the course of this campaign, and what I think voters want and deserve, which is a clear contrast between people with their visions for the office and the skills they bring to the office. So I think that ad encapsulates it pretty clearly. Um, you know, we've been up on the air for some time. Uh, we're increasing our intensity, and uh, we've got uh, 26 days until the election to keep making that case. So... How much money might you spend? <laughs> you know, it's going to be a function of uh, our uh, overall fundraising and, and my willingness to put in more money. And we've, you know, have, I've already demonstrated a significant willingness to, to put in money, demonstrated a significant ability to raise money. We raised more money than I think any Republican candidate in the state uh, during that period of time. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing is an acceleration in fundraising. So I think that's going to help us a lot. Um, but we still got uh, 26 days to, to see what, what our resources will be. Okay. And I'm sure we will see you again. In the meantime, I want to thank you very much for coming in and talking Thanks to us. Thanks for having us. me.